Hey, good morning, and welcome to uh, First Presbyterian Church. My pleasure to welcome you here. Uh, I'm Pastor Tim, and uh, it is my pleasure to uh, be uh, with you this morning. Uh, thanks for joining us, and uh, if anything goes haywire, just know that we got a few people that are filling in this week as people are on vacation, but we should be fine. Um, text me if there's a problem. I'll just say that, and then I'll, I'll tell someone that we got a problem, but we won't, might not fix it anyways. Uh, welcome. Uh, a couple of announcements as we uh, start off our worship service. One has to do with congregational meeting. Uh, know that the session is called a congregational meeting for the approval of a, a uh, uh, new pastor. And uh, next week is when that congregational meeting is going to take place. So I want to invite you to that and glad that you can come. Uh, hopefully you can come if you are a member to be a part of that. Uh, know that there's some details involved in, in when that's taking place and how it's taking place. Uh, we're doing it all remotely. So just read the letter. It should, be, should have come. If you didn't get the letter, somehow we'll get you a letter. So that's one big announcement. Uh, the second has to do with uh, the two regular things that are going on. One, we have a restaurant of the week. This week it's Pronto's Mexican food uh, up on Western and uh, 25th. And so if you wanna help support a local restaurant, we would love for you to do that. The other thing has to do with uh, our movie of the week. It's uh, watch a movie and then join the discussion on Wednesday during our happy hour. Uh, this week's movie is 42, uh, the story of Jackie Robinson and uh, we, are, we just want to invite you to participate in that. So the movie's 42. If you want to join the discussion, uh, message me or text me or email me, and I'll make sure that you get the Zoom invite to participate in that. It's a great movie, so I just want to encourage you uh, to participate in that. And I think that is it in regard to announcements. So we are going to continue on with uh, preparation for worship. And so it's a why don't you lead us?
Hear now the call to worship. Come all who are hungry and thirsty, the Lord will provide for our needs. Come this day to the well of living water. Here we will find welcome and thirst no more. Come to this time of gathering and praise, for the Lord is good. We come with open hearts and spirits to receive your gracious gifts of love. Please join me in prayer. God of living water, we come to you this day from times that are hectic. We are pulled in many directions, distracted by the world and its demands. Open our hearts to receive you. Deliver us from the temptation to just give up and flounder in the rough waters of life. Reach out to us with your strength and power and bring us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Well, as we continue in worship, I want to invite you now to join me in our prayer of confession. So would you pray with me? Gracious Lord, we are filled with a mixture of feelings today. Some of us are rejoicing in the wonderful time of rest and relaxation, while others continue to seek relief from the burdens and the worries that we bear. All of us stand in need of your refreshing and nourishing love and forgiveness. You know how many times we have turned our backs on those in need. We've been too busy, too preoccupied with our own problems. Cause us to turn around and see times in which we can be of help and comfort to someone else. Give us strength and courage to truly be your loving disciples in the ways in which we care for others. Forgive us when we stray from the paths of righteousness and peace. In these next moments, hear our personal prayers of confession. Lord, we realize that we do fall short of what you would like, like for us, of following your ways, doing your will. We do it because sometimes we think our way is better, and so, Lord, in those times, we ask for forgiveness. We ask that you would lead us to the right path, to go in the right way, to follow your way, so that we might share your love with others. So help us Forgive us, make us whole once again, so that we might serve you. Amen. Now hear these words of the assurance of our pardon. Rejoice! God's love is poured out over you this day for healing, restoration, and hope. Living water is poured out to you, so that you will no longer thirst. Feel the power of God's mercy in your life. Go into God's world knowing that you are forgiven and blessed, and be a blessing to others. So in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I declare to you, your sins are forgiven. Amen. And now let's sing in response to that. Now may the peace of Christ be with you. Hey, extend that peace to one another. Text someone. I want you to text someone that is far away from you. So uh, text them the peace of Christ and uh, pass that to one another. come to time in our service where we offer up words of prayer for those that we know that are in need of of help. Sometimes it's physical healing, sometimes it's emotional healing or relational healing. Uh, We want to be praying for our world, we want to be praying for our church, and uh, I just want to invite you to join me as we together, with one heart, lift up these prayers to our God. So let's take a few moments and pray. Lord, we do ask that you'd be with us as we uh, take a few moments to lift up our prayers to you. These aren't just my prayers, but they are our prayers. Together, gathered, even though we are in different spots, we are gathered together to lift our prayers to you. So Lord, hear our prayers now. Lord, our, our, our hearts yearn for healing in the lives of people that we know. Lord, we know that there are some that are suffering because of the loss of a loved one, or others are hurting because a loved one is ill. 
So Lord, we ask that you would be with those that are hurting, that are suffering, that are ill. We think of Ron's family. We think of Ingrid's family. We think of Tanisa's family. Lord, there are other situations that we know that your healing is needed. And we know, Lord, that you are the great physician. We also know, Lord, that your will will be done. So, Lord, we place these situations in your hands and ask, Lord, that you would be in the midst. Lord, we also want to be a people who are praying for our world and for things going on in the world. We pray especially for the COVID-19 virus. Lord, we pray that we would practice good, safe habits, but also, Lord, that this virus would would calm down and that it wouldn't be spreading from one person to another. So Lord, help us to be a part of the solution in that. Help us to understand the things that we need to do to uh, keep this virus from spreading and so that it doesn't hurt other people. And Lord, we pray that you would continue to look out for our world and for the things that are going on. Lord, we pray for our government leaders as they seek to help us to be safe in that regard, but also to lead us and to lead our, our country. Lord, we pray for those that are doing that on a national level, but also on a local level. And so, Lord, be with those government leaders, and we ask for your blessing upon them, but also for your wisdom and guidance to be upon them. Lord, we also pray for those that are suffering uh, because of natural disasters or man-made disasters. Lord, on the news, we've heard about two different hurricanes that are going to be uh, hitting landfall uh, in Texas and in Hawaii. Lord, there are probably situations all around the world that we don't know about. Uh, so, Lord, we pray that you would be in the midst of those who are suffering because of natural disasters. Lord, we also do pray for those that are suffering because of man-made disasters. There are situations where, um, where there is suffering because of wars. There are rumors of wars. There's strife between nations as they seek to up one another in different ways. And so, Lord, we pray that people, our leaders government leaders, business leaders, Lord, that they would seek you and your wisdom, that they would be guided by you in your way. So Lord, we lift those situations to you now. Lord, we also do pray for our church, and we pray especially for this church as it is beginning to uh, begin a new chapter as we uh, have a congregational meeting and vote upon our new pastor. And Lord, we pray for that as it takes place next week and that you'd be with all the details because we know already that it's gonna be awkward and uh, not done in the normal way. So Lord, we ask that you'd be in the midst of that meeting and in the process of helping uh, Jennifer get settled in this community and to begin that next chapter in this church as we seek to be your people, your disciples in this community, sharing the good news of your kingdom and your kingdom work with those that need to hear it. Lord, we want that, that, uh, that to take place and we want it to happen in a smooth way. So Lord, we pray that you'd be in the midst of it. And Lord, our prayer is that we would continue to be your kingdom people, that we'd share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. So Lord, help us with that and let us remember the way that you taught your disciples to pray by praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Hey, thank you, Corinne. Um, let's see, I gotta get settled here a little bit. But while I'm getting settled, this guy is a happy camper right now because I've been watching baseball every day since, what, Thursday? So it's been a good time. Uh, put a little plug in, I got my uh, Dodger mask right here, made by uh, Cam Beck, uh, available at Bagels Calore, both locations. Uh, so if you wanna get a Dodger mask, I think there's some there, I have no idea, but she makes them. She made this one for me, so I'm excited about that. Uh, we have a scripture lesson that comes from John chapter four. So I'll begin by reading from there. It's John chapter four, verses one to 10. God's word says this. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but the disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. Well, the Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan. I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Well, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let's pray. Lord, we ask that you be with us in these next moments as we have taken a few moments to open up your word and to glean our prayers that we would glean just a, a little bit more about what you would want us to do because of what we've read. So Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable to you, our Lord and our God. Amen. Well, uh, our kids were probably around preschool age, you know, four or five, maybe someone was six years old, but they had been playing down at our friend's house uh, down the street, and uh, as they came bursting into the house after playing with them, uh, I think it was Lizzie who announced to uh, my wife uh, that our friend's son, Nathan, had said the S word. So... Um, and he got in big trouble for it. Now, Karen and I sat down thinking that we now needed to have a talk with our kids because they had heard the S word and that they, uh, we need to tell them, you know, don't say that at certain times and make sure that they understood what had happened. So Lizzie said kind of what had happened. They'd been playing out in the back, backyard and uh, Nathan had said to his sister that she was stupid. He had said the S word and he got in big trouble for it, mom. Now we took a big sigh of relief because it was that S word and not the other S word that we thought we were gonna have to, uh, to talk about. Um, and you know, that talk was gonna come probably sometime in the future. Well, all, our story today ha has a different S word. And back in the day of Jesus, it truly was a curse word. Um, it was a word that was very derogatory. And in fact, one of the worst things that a Jew could call someone was a Samaritan, the dreaded S word. Now let me set the scene for Jesus, his encounter with a Samaritan woman at a well. In first century Palestine, there was a race war that was going on, and it was between Jews and Samaritans. There was hatred between the two, and it was deep, and it had been going on for centuries. Uh, think of it like a southern white clansman uh, toward black men and women in the mid 20th century. Samaria was located between Judea in the south and Galilee in the north. 
And 600 years before this, there had been an invasion of Israel. The Assyrians had invaded. Uh, they took out all the wealthy and noble Jews back to Assyria, and they imported uh, some other Assyrians into the country to kind of keep the peace. And there was an intermingling of people in that area, known as Samaria, by the Assyrians. So over 50, 60, 70 years, these people married one another, intermingled with customs and religious uh, uh, followings. And so they set up their own custom and their own religion. Uh, the temple, instead of being in Jerusalem, was on Mount Gerizim. And in fact, the, Jews came, uh, the Samaritans came up with uh, kind of a, a different code in regard to following uh, God. They followed the first five books of the scriptures. And the Jews had expanded upon that. Um, and so the Samaritans were seen as compromisers by the Jews. They were a mixed race, and they were people who had disobeyed God's law. So the Mar Samaritans were despised enemies of the Jews. And because of this, most Jews would go out of their way to avoid the region of Samaria. Now back in the first century Palestine, there were two main routes that people would take to go from the south, Judea, Jerusalem, up to Galilee in the north. They could go the inland route, uh, which was uh, by the, the Jordan River. Uh, it would take about two days longer to walk that route. Or there was a shorter route that went through the hill country, directly through Samaria. Now, it would be like us driving on Interstate 5 up to San Francisco. 5 is desolate, but it's faster. If you go Highway 1 or 101, it's much slower and longer, but you would avoid the 5 Freeway and the Central Valley. And so, even though it would take extra money to avoid, in order to avoid the people in the Central Valley, you're going to take that route. Jesus and his disciples are traveling Sumer to Samaria, through Samaria. And while Jesus' disciples go into town to buy some food, Jesus sits by a well because he is tired. Now let me say two things about that. First, note that Jesus was tired. And this reminds us that Jesus was human. He had the same physical and emotional characteristics that you and I have. His body it was like ours. And in this case, he was tired. He was weary. He was hungry. His muscles got sore. His emotions were like ours where Jesus showed compassion and sadness and joy. So he sat down by this well because he is tired while his disciples go into the, the town to get some food. The second thing to note is that Jesus places himself in an uncomfortable situation. He sat at the well. Of all the places for this Jewish rabbi to sit in Samaria, a well is probably the one spot where he might encounter someone. He could have sat under a tree. He could have walked into town with his disciples. It was risky for him to be by himself in this vulnerable place because he might encounter a Samaritan. It was especially risky because this was a well-known well, Jacob's well, a place that had sp spiritual significance to both Jews and Samaritans. So now while Jesus is at the well, a woman comes to gather some water. It was part of her daily routine. And Jesus speaks to her. Now, a Jewish man would never speak to a woman. And even more importantly, a Jewish rabbi would never address a Samaritan woman. And the interaction could uh, cause ritual uncleanliness. And one more detail. This woman is coming to the well in the middle of the day. Women usually came and got water in the cool of the day, at the beginning of the day. And they would come as a group, usually. Uh, the women, this woman comes alone. It's the middle of the day. Now, what this implies, and we learn a little bit more about her a little bit later, is that this woman, and probably the other woman, women, didn't want to be seen with her. And her sexual indiscretions may have caused her to be alone. So here is a single Samaritan woman with a reputation, and a single Jewish rabbi who is sitting next to a special well in the middle of the day, and he asks her for a drink. She knows this is scandalous. You're a Jew. 
I'm a Samaritan woman. How is it that you are asking me for a drink? Now, a typical submissive Palestinian woman would have just asked, done what the man had said, given him the water, and then go, gone about her business. But as you read further in the passage, you learn that the interaction between the woman and Jesus is about water. And Jesus gives her, takes her on a journey that's deeper uh, in her life. There's a need for living water. Now let me just give a brief summary. You can read it later on if you want. Jesus begins by t- talking with her and takes her to a place that she never could have imagined as the conversation started. He begins with a superficial thing, water. And as Jesus often does in his stories, he starts with a physical need or something in the physical world and then moves to something deeper, something on a spiritual level, deep to a person's soul. In this first step, he takes her to a place of understanding of her thirst. He offers her living water. Now John, in his writing of the gospel, uh, builds a portrait of Christ throughout the pages. Uh, You know that throughout this book, he uses various images and uses phrases that describe him as I am. He wants the readers to move toward the specific goal, the specific goal of writing uh, this gospel, which is to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So John 20, 31 says that he wants the readers to believe in Jesus. A little side note, if you want to be introduced to Jesus and why he came into the world, read the Gospel of John. It's a great introduction to Jesus' life and why he came to this earth. Okay, John often foreshadowed themes to build stories about Jesus. In John 7, Jesus talks about about living water. And the living water uh, Jesus offers is the Holy Spirit that will indwell the, the person and come to the deepest part of their soul, bringing life overflowing. Jesus wants this woman to understand that the thirst that she feels is something not just on the surface, but something that's deep within her. So what's her response? Sir, give me this water. Would you water, want water that satisfies your deepest thirst forever? And mysterious as it is, her heart longs for it. Now Jesus knows that in order to give her this living water, she needs to understand the true nature of her thirst, the deep nature of her thirst. But she's missing the point right now. So his next line is, go and call your husband. Now up to this point, we're not exactly sure of the tone of this woman's conversation with Jesus. After all, she had had five husbands. She's now living with a man who is not her husband. And it's altogether possible that her tone with Jesus is somewhat flirtatious. Uh, Perhaps this is part of her way with dealing with men. She's trying to feel out the situation, and she does so in the manner that she deals with in the best way that she can as she's interacting with men. But whatever has been going on in her mind, the conversation has just taken a turn. And of course, she gets a little defensive. I have no husband. That's right, Jesus says. Not only do you not, are you not living with your husband, but you have had five different husbands. When Jesus takes this woman to a place of telling her about her life, go and call her husband, her reaction to change the subject makes sense. She says, whoa, obviously you're a prophet. I don't know, but you know all about me. And when she starts talking about the differences in worship between Samaritans and Jews, um, I don't think she's trying to explore theology a little bit deeper with this guy. I think she's trying to kind of take him off a different tangent. Uh, She says, obviously you're someone special. You've got a great insight, so let's talk about worship. Now, in the Samaritan branch of Judaism, they tended to focus on the first five books of the Bible. And they disregarded the rest of the, 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 the the Old Testament. And they had set up their own sites of worship, and although this was a violation of God's direct command, she says, our our fathers worshiped at this mountain. And she goes on all the way back to the time of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, claiming common ancestry with the Jews. Now the Jews saw that this, uh, this well, Jacob's well, was an important part of their history. And so uh, he, she appeals to uh, this Samaritan place and it's probably as, as a distraction to Jesus. But Jesus doesn't buy into that. And so he taught, so they come to the fact that the Samaritans don't know what they're doing 
and the Jews are the ones who are on the right track, and God gives, um, he gives a little bit of an explanation of the Torah, but he gets back to, to what's most important. There is a time coming when none of this is going to matter, he says. It won't matter if you're uh, in Samaria or Jerusalem or somewhere else, because true worship is about worshiping in spirit. Now he takes you to the next step, how to satisfy her thirst. The satisfaction of our thirst begins with true worship. True worship is a spiritual exercise. It's not about location or rites or symbols or decorations. It's about connecting to God who is spirit. So true worshipers will worship him in spirit and in truth. Now she says in response, uh, I know the Messiah, the anointed one of God who is coming and God has promised to come He's going to explain everything to us. Well, Jesus takes it one step further. In perhaps the most critical statement in this whole story, Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. Literally, the statement is, I am the one who is speaking to you. Or, the one who is speaking to you, I am. Now, a Samaritan who is rooted in those first five books of the Old Testament, this woman's mind would have immediately gone to that statement that God gave to Moses at the burning bush when Moses asked him, who should I tell the people you are? And Jesus says, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. You can read about that in Exodus 3. I am, or Yahweh, is the personal name of the God of the covenant with the people of Israel. Jesus, the man that is standing before her, who has just revealed everything about her and her past, looks her in the eye and says, I am. Now John tells the story, tells the, John tells story after story of Jesus using that phrase, I am. Uh, when he's challenged by the Pharisees, Jesus says to their face, before Abraham was, I am, in John 8. He links, links certain descriptive words about him. I am the bread of life in John 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14. I am the resurrection and the life in John 11. Jesus takes for himself that personal name of God. And take note, we are in John chapter 4. And so it's early in Jesus' life in this, uh, as, Jesus, as John is writing about him. And I am, I am God is first revealed to this woman of ill repute in the country of Samaria, a place that's despised by Jews, a place where they would never go. Now this woman who is sent by, who, the woman who has spent her life looking for love in relationship after relationship after relationship has just been in the presence of a man who knows everything about her, every flaw, every sin, every weakness, and he does not condemn her. She feels loved. She sees mercy. Mercy. She is fully known, but fully loved. And the God who sees is now present with this Samaritan woman. And her heart is full of joy and gratitude. And so with that joy, she leaves her, her jar there and goes back into town to tell everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? There's more that takes place in the story, but I want to point out one final thing. It was the Samaritans of the town who came out to Jesus, and then they asked Jesus to stay two days. Now, can you imagine the discussion that took place amongst the disciples? You know, they're heading from L.A. up to the Bay Area. Uh, they're not going up PCH or the 101. They're going up the 5. It's the faster route. They want to get back home to Galilee. And... They stop Kettleman City, they pull off, they go into in and out they get their burgers, they're gassing up the car, they're ready to get going on the road, back home, and what happens? Jesus is off talking to some woman. And they probably think that he's wasting time doing that. They want to get up, they want to get moving, they want to get going on the road. And not only that, after he talks to the woman, they stay in Kettleman City for two days. That has got to be the worst. 
You can see the disciples are headed, they want to go back to Galilee. That's their next spot. That's where they want to go on their agenda. They're excited about going home. And they can't figure out why Jesus is stopped. Talk to a woman and then decides that it's best if they stay in this town for two more days. How many times are you like that? I know I'm like that. I've got an agenda. There's things that I got to do. And so I want to get those things done. And it's important. I mean, there are things that we do need to get done in our daily lives. We spend time, uh, you know, getting those things done so that our to-do list is done and then we can kind of enjoy the rest of the day. But sometimes we need to pause because Jesus has placed someone in our lives that we need to talk to. We put aside the to-do list instead and, and need to, to see what, where Jesus has placed us at that point, at that time. Jesus says to the disciples, do you think ministry is going to happen in Galilee? Stop, look around. The fields are ripe for the harvest right here. You could reap this harvest even though you didn't plant the crop, if you were aware and if you were paying attention. He moves the disciples away from their own conceptions, their own agenda, and lines it up with God's agenda, which is loving and caring for the people here in Samaria right now. And that is what it's about. So Jesus and his disciples stay for two days. Again, it probably drove Peter crazy. He wanted to get going. It probably drove Judas crazy because he's in charge of the money. Now he has to fork out some money for hotel rooms. They, they are going to stay in Samaria for two whole days. Well, why does he do that? It's to love the people that are there. My food, Jesus says, is to do the will of him who has sent me, to finish his work. Jesus wants his disciples to understand that this is his agenda, to minister to people like the Samaritans, like the Samaritan woman, who is so thirsty that she doesn't even know that she needs this help. It is Jesus that he is presenting to her and to the Samaritans. That is Jesus' agenda, to help them worship the true Messiah. And so he reaches out to them. Two final thoughts. First, sometimes in order to minister in Jesus' name, we may need to be in uncomfortable situations. In this encounter with Jesus, he went by the way which was uncomfortable for a Jew. He traveled through Samaria. But it was pre precisely because Jesus traveled on this particular route to an uncomfor uncomfortable place in this awkward situation that he is able to share God's message of living water with a Samaritan woman. And this woman was so changed that a whole town in Samaria is impacted. Now there will be times in our lives, opportunities that are presented to us where we are going to be uncomfortable. We may even be fearful in that situation where God can use you as his spokesperson in that place. We need to protest racial injustice. We need to go to neighborhoods, neighborhoods where we might not feel safe in our eyes uh, to, in order to, uh, to, to share God's love. We may need to fight against and push against systemic poverty and injustice. We may need to go to TI, to, to Terminal Island, and, and meet with the prisoners there, to build relationships with the prisoners, and to share Jesus with them. God may be leading you to an uncomfortable place, and it's there in the midst of those places where some risk might be involved, but Jesus demonstrates that that is exactly where he wants you. And second, wherever God may lead you, we need to be ready to have conversations about the gospel. Wherever God may lead us, we need to be ready to share the gospel. I'm not saying that you have to have all the answers in that risky place where God has placed you. But what I am saying is we need to be ready to share the gospel and be God's spokesperson in that place when it's appropriate. The Holy Spirit will prompt you when you need to speak, but when you are prompted, speak. Share about Jesus. If you hear a story and prayer is appropriate, ask for permission to pray for that person. 
You could do it right then. You might say, I'm going to pray for you once I get back home. But the thing that we need to do is to insert the gospel in that situation. Wherever these conversations may take place, we need to offer love and grace and mercy, just as Christ has offered that to us in our own lives. So may this encounter with Jesus, with this woman at the well, be an example for us. May it be an inspiration to share the love of God through Christ Jesus. It may be risky, it may be uncomfortable, but when we do so, we're placing God's kingdom in that place, in that town, in the situation in which God has placed us. And we're bringing a little bit of heaven here on earth, just as it is in heaven. And with that, let's pray. Lord, we are grateful for this time that we've had to take a few moments to be reminded that we are to go into uncomfortable places, sometimes in places that are with people that are different than us, people that we might even despise, or at least people around us might despise. But Lord, we are called to go into those places and to share the good news of your love with those people, to offer grace and mercy and love. So may we be a people who go into those places, go in your name, so that people may know that your kingdom is here, just as it is in heaven. Amen. Well, as we continue in worship, we bring God's tithes and offering. It's our opportunity to give to his kingdom work. Some of that's going to happen here in San Pedro. Some of it's going to happen a continent away. But we do so with joy and thanksgiving because God's kingdom is ever expanding. And he is reclaiming his kingdom here on earth, just as it is in heaven. So we do this all with much joy. Lord, we dedicate these tithes and offerings to you for your work and the expansion of your kingdom here in San Pedro and around the world. Amen.
Well, as we close, uh, let me remind you, next Sunday, congregational meeting. Also know, because of the, the health restrictions, we aren't allowed to have a group of people in the sanctuary. So it's all gonna be via Facebook Live or uh, Zoom. And uh, just know that the way you're gonna, it's all explained in the letter, but just we can't meet physically in, in the same room. So that's one thing. Also know that if you want to meet Jennifer with one of the meet and greets via Zoom, contact Cam Beck, contact the church office. We'll get you in touch, but there, I know there's a, a few more sessions of those that are happening right now. And then also, if you didn't get the letter from, uh, from the church in regard to all that's be going, going to take place, and I know mail has been slow, so we apologize for that, but it's, it's, it's U.S. Postal Service right now. Um, Contact the church office, contact Cam Beck. Uh, they'll make sure that you have the information that's in those letters um, the best that we can. So don't forget, next Sunday, congregational meeting, an important one. It's going to be via the live stream. If you come to the church, we're not going to be able to let you in because of the health restrictions. So just know that that's the situation that we're in right now. And now receive the benediction. This morning we met a Samaritan woman who met Jesus Christ. And in that risky, awkward situation, Christ shared the living water, a living water that caused her to not thirst any longer. And a whole town was changed because of that encounter. So as we take risks in our own life of going into uncomfortable situations, may we share the good news of the gospel in those situations so that towns and households will know that Jesus Christ is the living water that will satisfy our souls for eternity. So we do that with grace and love and mercy as we go out into this world as God's people. And all of God's people said, Alleluia. Amen. Amen.